Good morning, everyone. I trust that you're having a good morning and that you've had your second cup of coffee. I'm through about a cup and a half. So uh, if I stumble over my words, you know why. But uh, I'm happy to welcome you back to our Facebook Live uh, Bible study. And uh, I trust that these times have been a help to you and a blessing as I know they have been to me. I have really enjoyed interacting with you in this way and getting the feedback. And uh, through COVID-19, it's been one of the bright spots. And I'm thankful to the Lord for this. And uh, it's been a busy morning already. And uh, I want to just uh, give you an update about uh, Pat and Kurt Chapman. Many have uh, already, I say many, I, there's been about four people that have reached out to me in the last hour and a half or so uh, that have asked about how they're doing. And I want to just say that uh, Pat uh, continues to be in very critical condition in the ICU. Uh, her oxygen levels are remaining stable uh, through the night. She developed somewhat of an erratic heartbeat. And so uh, they're uh, monitoring that very closely. As you know, she suffered a stroke um, uh, yesterday, uh, probably in the very early morning hours, and uh, they're treating her for that as well. And she needs a miracle touch from the Lord, and she needs us to really lift her to the Lord in prayer. And uh, also, Kurt uh, continues to recover from COVID-19 at home. He's doing a little bit better each day, but as you can well imagine, his heart is burdened down. He is uh, just distraught uh, for the condition of his beloved wife and his desire to be at her side. And so uh, despite his, uh, his own weakness, he's trying to shoulder, uh, soldier on and, and just do what he's supposed to do to try to uh, get himself well and stay in touch with uh, the hospital. But he also needs our uh, ongoing prayer effort, as do many others in our church family. And I want to just mention that um, there are a number of people that uh, I'm, I'm aware of that are suffering <clears throat> with illness. And uh, I've been reminded on a number of occasions that because of HIPAA laws that uh, we're, uh, we're needing to be a little more cautious <clears throat> just in the information that we share publicly and over the internet. Uh, without the consent of the family or the individual themselves. And so uh, if there seems to be a little reserve sometimes about that, that's the very reason. And uh, the sad reality is that we're living in a day where people just have uh, no problems suing a church. And there was a day where nobody would have ever considered that, but it's something that's happening every single day in our country. And many churches have been sued because of uh, what uh, have been uh, reported to be HIPAA violations by people asking prayer for someone naming the, the illness, and then their loved one uh, objects, calls a lawyer, and they find themselves in court. And oftentimes it disrupts the ministry on such a level that in some cases it even closes churches altogether uh, because of the size of the settlements and um, uh, things of that uh, sort. And so we're trying to be uh, very wise in the way that we deal with these things and, and uh, certainly we want to be uh, bold in our God to speak the truth. Uh, but of course, we want to respect uh, uh, the privacy of others. And, uh, and at the same time, we want to share prayer requests to the extent that we've been given the liberty to do so. And so Please uh, just pray for me that the Lord would give me wisdom uh, in all of these things. And uh, I want us to go to Romans 12, and we're going to take another step in our study here. And uh, I believe that these are perhaps uh, the most relevant uh, few portions of Scripture that we could uh, possibly choose to consider in these days in which we're living. And I think that it speaks to exactly what is going on in our culture, in our country, and in our churches, and even in our homes. And so I, I want to just challenge you to really pray and ask the Lord to minister these messages, these verses, these truths to your heart. 
uh, so that we might be more formed into the image of Jesus. And uh, we're going to begin reading this morning here in verse number 17. And the Bible says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray for a moment. Our Father, we bow before you this morning so thankful that you are a sovereign God. That Lord, as a sovereign God, you rule and you overrule in the affairs of this life. And Lord, there are many circumstances that we come to you about that we desire for you to overrule, that Lord, you would show yourself strong in the behalf of your people. Lord, we lift Pat to you today. We pray that you might be with her, touch and heal her. And Lord, we want to give you the glory and the praise for what we know that you can do, and we trust by faith that you will do. God, be with Kurt, comfort his heart as he's going through these difficult days and so many others that are suffering through this season of a global pandemic. God, today, use me to be a blessing, I ask, as I seek to minister the truth of your word in um, a way that we can understand and that we can uh, appropriate into our daily lives and may you receive the glory because of it for this we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus amen now um, I want to just say that uh, I poured my heart out to you last night uh, as I preached I heard from some that there was a little buffering on sermon audio and it's my hope that we can get that sermon uploaded because I really feel like it's something that would be a help to everyone uh, in our church family. I don't know if there were people that got a little discouraged and, and logged off or didn't come on, uh, but it seemed like we had fewer viewers last night than we had had in quite some time on a Wednesday. And, uh, and do, do you know, I got to tell you something. It takes just as much work for me to preach to 30,000 as it does to 30. And I know I would rather preach to 30,000. And uh, so, uh, help me with that, and uh, we can send some of this stuff viral. I mentioned a couple of days ago uh, that we have sermons on Sermon Audio, and people can email a sermon to a friend, and uh, since I mentioned that, uh, we have had one sermon that has been emailed, and I appreciate the one person uh, that did that, and so um, and not a lot of respondents, um, and I, I realize this is just one component of people's lives, but it seems that as much time as people are spending on the internet, uh, we could use five minutes of it redemptively to help others. And that's just one small way uh, that we could do so. As we consider this, we understand that our testimony is on display at all times. People are watching us. Uh, I've told this story before, but I think it is something that bears telling again. And that is that I remember uh, some years ago, we had a family that was visiting the church and um, they were friends of a friend and they uh, were from a, a good solid uh, Baptist church background and they, they visited. And upon their second visit, they were considering making uh, the church their church home. And, and so we invited them uh, home for dinner. And uh, they, they came over and the kids were much smaller at that time. And uh, I can remember that uh, we're, we're sitting there having our meal and one of the children uh, just was reaching for the biscuits or something, um, Pastor Pat going for those biscuits and, uh, and knocked over their milk, spilled it all over the table and it was kind of run on the floor. And uh, 
All of a sudden, that family just froze and their eyes just looked directly at me. And uh, what I did was I, I said, whoops, <laughs> let's grab a towel. So I got up and I went and I grabbed a towel and, you know, and we started mopping it up. And I said, man, accidents happen, don't they? And uh, we, we cleaned it up. I sat back down and they sat there in stunned silence. And uh, later that evening, uh, they wanted to speak to me after the evening service. And they said, uh, we've, we've decided to join the church. I said, that's wonderful. They said, you know what made our, our minds up for us? We watched how you conducted yourself when your child spilled their milk all over the table. They said, we've been around a lot of people that would just go ballistic and start yelling at the kid and, and uh, getting frustrated and huffing and puffing. And they said, but we, we watched how you conducted yourself when that happened. And we decided this is the type of shepherd that we would like to sit under. And at the moment, I had no idea that that was being evaluated, that that was going to be a part of the criteria by which my pastorate was going to be judged. It wasn't so much the preaching. It wasn't so much that everybody was friendly. They wanted to see what they thought was some temperance in my testimony, the way I conducted myself, not just by what I said from the pulpit. And just as they were watching me I think we all need to be aware that this world is watching all of us. They are especially watching us if they know that we are believers because they want to see if there's anything different about you. They want to see if you're real or if you're just full of yourself and a big hypocrite. If you go off and fly off at the handle and and uh, get upset just like everybody else because they reason in their own hearts and minds that if you're just like everybody else, why should they want what you have? And my friends, to an unsaved person, that's a valid question. The truth is we as Christians could think of a, a million reasons why that they should want what we have, but if we're not living a transcendent life that demonstrates the genuineness of our faith and the joy of the Lord, then they don't see anything that's apparent in our lives that they should desire. I believe that it is important for us to get a hold of this. And in verse number 19, the Bible says, Dearly beloved. And before I jump into the truth that follows that, I just want to say that the Apostle Paul loved these believers. Uh, he often referred to the saints as dearly beloved and they were loved by him and they loved him. He had a ministry to them. In many cases, he was their father in the faith, having been used of the Lord to bring them uh, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they loved him for it. In the end, there were many that turned away from him because uh, he, they perceived him to be a liability or uh, maybe they didn't understand all of his imprisonments and uh, maybe they thought he was a little bit of a rebel rouser. But the truth is that mankind since the time of the cross and before has hated Jesus and his followers. And uh, listen, they delight to persecute the people of God. Jesus said, uh, no, if the world uh, hates you, it hated me first. And so we as the children of God are going to be hated and despised. But we understand this, that God calls us to love one another. I, I, I love it when people come to Freeway and they say, you know, that's the friendliest church I've ever been to. That ought to be what they think. And uh, that ought to be what they take away from from Freeway Baptist Church. And I'm not talking about being patronizing and just glad handing for the sake of it, but really truly making a connection with people, giving them your eye contact. And uh, we, we obviously at this time are not shaking hands and 
giving hugs and at this time we're maintaining social distancing. But you know, listen, there's things that we can do to communicate the love of the Lord. And you know, there's nothing preventing us from just uh, hauling off and saying to our brother, sister in the Lord, I want you to know I love you. Uh, this morning I got a call from uh, a brother in Christ who was weeping and going through some things and just needed to talk. And And I said, you know, I, I want to tell you something, friend. I love you. And uh, God loves you, but I want you to know you got a friend and I love you uh, very sincerely. And, and I, I assured him that God had a wonderful purpose and plan for his life and uh, wanted to affirm him in every way. And you know what? That just needs to be uh, as uh, natural uh, for the believer as as anything that we do. We just need to have that as a part of the DNA of the Christian life that we love. Because by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one toward another. And so I, I think that as we begin this verse, Paul is giving them a strong admonition, but he's uh, really letting them know, dearly beloved, he's giving them a term of endearment and of affirmation. And I think that that is a lesson in and of itself to us who read this passage. But then the admonition he brings is this, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Do you know what God is communicating to us through his word is that it's not our job to try to take it upon ourselves to make all that's wrong right. It's, it never has been uh, since the garden and it never will be until Christ establishes his kingdom and we have a righteous and a holy God ruling from the throne of David. And the truth of the matter is, my friends, that um, there's always going to be injustice in this world. There's always going to be offenses in this world. The Bible tells us that it is a possible, impossible, but that offenses will come. And uh, But woe to be to him to whom, through whom they come. Listen, it, it's going to happen. And the Bible says in the book of James, for in many ways uh, we offend all. That means that, look, in many different ways, we're all offenders. Uh, we all have hurt other people's feelings. We've all done things either purposefully or unknowingly uh, to injure someone else. And the truth is that if we went around trying to right every wrong, uh, we would never get anything done. And we would be known as uh, a very, very bitter and venomous, toxic individual. But the Bible says, avenge not yourselves. Don't go around trying to exact a pound of flesh, telling everybody what you think about things. Now, I'll just say this, and you think about it, that there are times where we get our feelings hurt, and we take things so personally. And uh, we begin to really mull it over. We ruminate on it, man. And... Uh, we, we get upset the more we think about it. And you know, the person that we're mad about and mad at, uh, probably they didn't even mean it like you, you're taking it. And in fact, they may not even know you're upset because they didn't mean any harm by what they said. But man, we work that thing up in our mind and we reason that thing out and we go to Proverbs and find some little isolated text and try to... Uh, have that equivocate to, man, this person's got a deep-rooted spiritual problem. And the reality is that you might be the one that has a deep-rooted spiritual problem because you're so easily offended. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 135, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. So look, if, if I'm dead to self but alive unto God, and I love the word of God and I'm delighting myself in the Lord through his word, then you know what? Um, I'm going to be at peace and I'm not going to be taking up offense at little dumb stuff and, 
and mulling it over and thinking on it and talking about it and asking other people that are not a part of that. I wonder what they meant by that. You know, why did they say that? You know, and you know, listen, if you wonder, call them. If you want to know, go see them. Follow Matthew 18. All right. Just do what the Bible teaches. And by the way, only the spiritual one is going to take the initiative to go to that person. Okay. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 that if a, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one. So that person who's going to uh, really have the fullness of the Holy Spirit will take the initiative to go. Uh, if thou goest to the altar, rememberest that thy brother has aught against thee, leave thy gift there, go to thy brother, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And what we need to do is take that initiative. Now, we're going to be offended we're going to be hurt. Just mark it down. We don't live in a utopian world. We live in a sin-cursed world with evil people in it. And sometimes uh, we too easily take up offense. Now, I'm going to tell you, sometimes what we want to do is uh, we want to fix that person's wagon, so to speak. We're going to get even with them. And yet the command is, avenge not yourselves. And then what follows that is this, rather give place unto wrath, give place unto wrath. Now, some people I know are going to say, well, you know, Pastor Mark is saying that I need to be a doormat, you know, and I'm not going to be anybody's doormat. Or Pastor Mark's, you know, teaching me that I need to be a weakling. I, I want to ask you a question. Do you think Jesus was weak? I'm going to tell you something. Jesus was not weak. He worked in a carpenter shop for the first 30 years of his life, I think he had rough leather hands. I think he had calluses. I think his hands were strong. Uh, I, I don't think they had vice grips back then. I think they had strong hands. The truth is, I think Jesus uh, uh, probably had strong arms. I believe he had strong shoulders. I think that he worked hard and was in every way a strong person. But do you know to have strength of character is to have temperance such that when we are offended, we don't answer evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise peace. Those that are weak-minded people and weak of character, uh, what they want to do is retaliate. But those that are strong will hold their peace and give place unto wrath. And you know what? They'll say, look, this isn't the place. This isn't the time to air this out. Uh, this is not the offense uh, for which I'm willing to sacrifice my testimony. This isn't it. I'm going to give place unto wrath. In other words, there may be a time for me to be righteously indignant, but this isn't it because God is calling me, and in the context of this, we know it, to live out the life of Jesus, and to demonstrate the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned a couple days ago that I've had too many people through the years try to rationalize their anger and their hostilities by the fact that Jesus cleansed the temple and he took a, a whip and he drove the money changers out of the temple and he overturned their tables. And they say, see there, Jesus had a temper too. And Jesus was angry and he did this. Listen, uh, we talked about the difference between a reaction and a response. That was a response, you see. Jesus didn't just fly off the handle and say whatever. He said, it is written. It was something that from before the foundation of the world was true and God knew when that he was confronted by those things, how he was going to respond. It was a thought out and a well-formulated response, not a reaction. And he was not angry at the person. He was angry at the sin and what it represented about the people and their mindset toward a holy God, that they had lost a sense of the fear of the Lord, and they saw the church as a means of a shortcut uh, to where they wanted to go in life. They saw it as a place to social network. They saw it as a place where they could conveniently have a little God, have him bless their life, but not want to esteem him in the beauty of his holiness. And so 
it was an offense to God in the flesh, and he dealt with it in a, a strength of character, in a well-formulated response, not a reaction. He gave place unto wrath. So he didn't single uh, the money changers out outside of the temple. Say, I know what you're doing, you bunch of stinking scoundrels. No, he dealt with it there so people understood that principally here the God-man was taking a stand on that which was righteous. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, be ye angry and sin not. What that means is I can be upset with sin, but I am not going to go off on and destroy the sinner. Because, uh, listen, I love that song that says, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep or the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. And, and I just want you to know that our duty is not to try to straighten out what's wrong in everybody's life, but to make sure that we're living the life of Jesus and then respond to situations like this in a way that would allow others to see the living Lord in us. And it doesn't mean that you're a doormat or a weakling. It perhaps means that you have a fortitude and a strength of character that is transcendent. Anybody can go off and throw a childish fit. That's what gets a lot of people in trouble. We have uh, people running amok in the streets of the cities of our country uh, that are trying to get vengeance for what they perceive to be a wrong that has been perpetrated against themselves or even other people that they know. But listen, give place unto wrath. Let God be the one who is the avenger of all such things. For the Bible then says, listen, give place unto wrath, okay? Not in your life. Don't give it a place in your life, all right? But for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So God is telling us very specifically, vengeance or the punishment for sin, that belongs to me. That's my job. So when we try to take vengeance or get even or uh, try to have a, an equal and you know corresponding action for every action, there's an equal and, and a corresponding reaction. Of course, the law of physics, and sometimes we see that playing out in our own lives. But the truth is that look, we need to say that's not my job. That's what God says is His role. So when I try to take vengeance, guess what? I am subverting Almighty God and I am setting myself up as Lord and Master of my life. I am removing God from the throne of my life. I'm taking matters into my own hand. I'm effectively saying, God, I don't think you're handling this the way it needs to be handled. So I've got this, God. I'll take over for you because... You're not doing what you need to do, God. That's what people do. Look, they think somebody has offended, so you know what? They think that they are uh, some divinely appointed executioner of God's wrath upon everybody that has committed some offense, and so, man, they're going to get a blog, and they're going to go on social media, and they're going to start a, a chain letter, and they're going to uh, get a petition going, and they're going to talk to everybody. Listen, who died and left you, God? Who said it was your job to make everything that's wrong in this world right? Who said it was your responsibility to meddle in other men's matters? God said, that's my job. So you need to crawl down off the throne, mister, and you need to let God do what God does. He says, I'll deal with sin. The, the people of Israel in the book of Malachi were insolent with God because when there was a problem in the priesthood, they thought God was a little too slack-handed to deal with it. And so they came to God himself and they said, where is the God of justice? And because God wasn't doing what they thought he should do on their time schedule, they thought it was to them to take matters into their own hands. My friends, it's not up to you to start taking matters into your own hands. God said, that's my job. Vengeance 
is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. If someone needs payback, that's my job. Now, do you know what the Bible teaches us? And I don't have time to go all into it right now. But if you take God's part in trying to measure out vengeance upon offenders, do you know what? God will in some cases let that be their recompense. And so you know what? Maybe God would have dealt with them more harshly. But because you stepped in, he'll say, sufficient for that punishment is what these people have measured out. And you know what? God always does a better job of things than we do. If we want God to really get somebody, let me tell you something. If you rejoice when that happens, the Lord said he'll turn away his wrath from them and some of that is going to be visited upon you. I'm like you through the years. I've had some people that have treated me unfairly, unjustly. They've told lies on me and, uh, and it hurts and, and it's hurt people that I love. But you know what? I had to pray for that person. I had to show love to that person. I had to show Christ's likeness to that person because listen, it wasn't up to me to try to degrade them to try to tear them down, to try to somehow suggest that God wasn't doing what uh, was his job to do. And so I needed to take over from here and just play God for a little while because I knew better than him. And, and, and to think that somehow God doesn't see it, he doesn't know it, he doesn't care about it, he's not going to do anything, is just ignorance and the sin of presumption. And it is God playing. We have set ourselves up as the just one. And the fact is that that's not the case. The only true and just judge has nail scars in his hands, and that is Jesus. So listen, if somebody hurts your feelings, I'm sorry that they have, but don't take matters into your own hands. Trust that God in his own good way and in his own good time is going to deal with it according to the offense. And it's not up to us to try to dictate to God what he needs to do or how quickly he needs to do it. Listen, don't take up the offenses for everybody else under the sun. Boy, that's what we do. And what it reveals sometimes is a real lack of spiritual maturity and development. I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. People are watching you. They're trying to decide if they want to be a part of that church down there. They're, they're trying to decide whether or not they want to uh, hear a little bit more about your Savior. They're, they're trying to decide if what you have is really real. And if you're always taking up offense and measuring out vengeance and talking about people and cankered and bittered in your spirit, I know what they're going to think. You know, they're not any different than anybody else. I think I'll just look for something better because they don't have any diff anything different than what I've got. You know, I want people to see a difference in my life. Do you? And I want that difference to be Jesus. And I hope that you feel that very same way. I want you to know that God loves you so much. And so do we. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.